Greetings all. Welcome to Aquarian Diary. I'm your host, John Irving. It is July 26th, 2023. The following is part two of a conversation I recorded with Dr. Nadine Sullivan on July 24th, 2023. Dr. Sullivan is a sociologist, anthropologist, intuitive spiritual counselor, interfaith minister, author, and hypnotherapist. Of course, you'll want to listen to part one first, if you haven't already. I'll put a link to that in the episode description. I have also created a conversations playlist on YouTube. If you enjoy these sorts of discussions, please check that out. Your comments and feedback are always appreciated, as is sharing this with others, which is very helpful. Thanks in advance for that. By the way, if you're listening to this and you're really struggling financially, but feel that you could benefit from some help in the form of an astrology reading, please contact me. I am willing to take extraordinary circumstances into account with my pricing. I trust that people won't take advantage of this just to save money. This offer is intended for those who are facing significant challenges. Part 2 of my discussion with Nadine veers into some broader social issues, including the environmental crisis. Here's Part 2. Do you think that if, like your methodology or technique here, mm -hmm. if it's effective, does that break the karmic link as well? So two thoughts on that. Yes. I That's think good. it I think I think it's it feels to me like a form of soul healing that breaks all kinds of karmic links. Oh my god, that's hugely um, beneficial. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it really does feel like that's what's That's happening. probably more beneficial than the right. symptoms they're experiencing. Right. Now, on the other hand, I do as a survivor and this is me personally, this isn't, isn't me from any kind of, you know, knowledge gained in the other realm. But me personally, as as somebody and somebody reads my book, I trusted you, they'll, you know, see what I survived. But as a survivor, I find it unpalatable to this this the I to say to victims that they made a contract on the other side and that that perpetrator was doing us a favor uh, sticks in my craw. Me um, too. So Thank you. I, I, because so there because was i've heard great... that uh, i've heard that said so many times and people say it I so know. casually and it, it seems so dismissive and victimizing and, it, and i'm like what the f that there's no f like go on. right it is <laughs> it, it, it angers it, it, me it, it's victim blaming it pisses me off exactly yeah. so it's the the and you know and we've heard it from like famous people too um but the idea so at one point my the, a man who was my godfather and my great grand uncle, grand uncle, my great grandmother's brother. So my father had known him his whole life. He was the age of his grandparents, right? This man's still in my life the day I turned 21 and he got inappropriate that day. I'll leave it there. Um, it didn't, it didn't go far because he was 84 and I was 21. And so I knocked him off, but his intention was clear. <sighs> so to believe that he was doing me a favor, what he said to me in that moment was, he didn't see me as human. And, wait, and wait, so- Wait, you mean literally at that time or are you doing this retrospectively? No, at that time, my emotional feeling in response to his perpetration was this man that I have adored, that was my godfather, right? This man does not see me as oh, okay. a human being worthy of respect, right? right. And so- I lost all respect for him in that sec in those nanoseconds. And, right. you know, right. um, the trauma was bigger than that, but, um, but in that, in that moment. Um, and so what I believe about that moment, and I will say his name cause he's long deceased, but what I believe in regard to my uncle Charlie was that he had a moral responsibility, whatever had happened to him in his childhood, whatever had happened that had caused him to be someone, because he then also sexually assaulted a younger sibling um, mm -hmm. later than that. Um, and, and he had 
been married to a woman um, who had a Down syndrome sister, um, sister that they took care of, and she was completely nonverbal. And so it gave me nightmares about what her reality may have been living um, with him and, and his and her sister all those years. Yeah. So in all of that, I believe he had a moral responsibility to not to make a choice not to perpetrate. Right. That's what yeah. I believe. So have I been able to use it and change it and, and heal myself and, and be the wounded healer to others? Yes. Um, Was it is necessary? It no. Is it, right. is it possible that somewhere in the other realm, I knew this would be part of my life path and I, but maybe, but as far as him doing me a favor, no, he didn't, and he didn't do himself any favor. Yeah. Um, you didn't need to have that. Well, I don't know, maybe on some higher level you did, but uh, that's but kind I didn't of, that's need a little it from him. It didn't need yeah. to be this person that I loved and trusted. It didn't need to be, you know, so, so, so I do think we plan our lives ahead of time. I did see in one hypnosis, I did see um, me picking my father as my father, because in his Catholicism, he was very gendered. And while he was a lovely man, and he was never a perpetrator of any kind, he did believe girls had a, women had a place and that pissed me off. And it made me, it made me get up and start writing. So that book that wasn't done when I got mm -hmm. shot, you know, I, I went back and I finished that book. Um, so maybe I picked him for that, but, it, but he also, you know, he was also a loving dad. There were a lot of good things from him too. Right. You know, you're never um, going to get perfect here unless you're like born to the right. Buddha or Christ and, you know, or something like that. Right. So that's the problem is that this place is a bit of a clusterfuck. And right. It, so I don't believe perpetrators are doing a, I don't believe they're saintly souls. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard, I heard somebody say that, oh, this invasion of Ukraine by oh. uh, was, was is part of the big plan and these people volunteered to be you know obliterated and i'm just kind of like yeah like no like w that's not the kind of world we need to live in right you know people want to do that kind of crap they should go incarnate somewhere else screw them like really they destroyed an entire civilization basically over right. there and i'm like what the how, what purpose does They're bombing their historic buildings and then they'll be like this many people died and that many people were injured well what the hell injuries do they have what are they now living with are they living without arms and legs what are they you know like what and and what or they'll tell a story they'll be like so and so was shot the father was driving his child this father was shot and killed the child's fine that child's never going to be no, fine. No, i know yeah and, and that the other thing is yeah. that we know we now know that uh trauma you know moves down it passes through the generations. so it's not just the people that are there now it's like probably the next five or six generations of people who are going to be affected by this and the five or six lifetimes that we've got next right yeah I like mean, if if i was running the world that we'd just be like no you take out you know take, take him out of the game <laughs> what i what i have never seen yeah i hear you what i have never seen in a client so i've been doing this since 2007 like you know, many times a week. What I have never seen in a client is I've never seen someone who was a victim. They've never reported a life in which they were the perpetrator. Really? And that's kind of common parlance too. It's sort of like, well, if you get murdered, maybe you were a murderer. Right. I'm not finding that in my data. Now, I'm not huh. saying it's not possible, but what I have found is that this person telling a story about being a victim they also often tell stories about being victims four or five times in a row. Yeah, well, that's that's that <laughs> that's the that's the manifesting again, right? That's the yeah. carrying the, the trauma forward, right? Yeah, I can kind of get that that they're resonating that sort of right. victim experience, and then of course, perhaps on some level, they're drawing it to themselves. And then I can help it heal from that karmically, but I don't know that they ever were the murderer or that they ever were the perpetrator. Right. Like, Is I'm, it possible I'm, that they just block those kinds of more negative expressions out? They don't want to remember or tap into or connect to those kinds maybe. of lifetimes? I mean, maybe it's also possible that they never perpetrated and that's that that's our we make theologies, right? right Based right disconnected from data we built sort of air castles of what we think i mean the catholic heaven full of yeah. the original full sin of fat babies and big angels with wings right right so the original sin right we build these air castles of theology and that might just be like some bullshit we made up well it might just be a way to justify all this crap mm -hmm. right right like like to me and this kind of goes circles back to where we started <laughs> uh uh before we recorded um right but to me, this whole thing is completely absurd and stupid and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. 
like on, on a lot of levels. I mean, don't get me wrong. Oh, I love nature and there's certain aspects of being human and being in reality that are just fabulous. You know, I, I go out in the, you know, step outside and, and mm -hmm. I will marvel at uh, snails and slugs right. and bees. And cause they're just like incredible mm -hmm. feats of engineering, <laughs> you know, like they're just amazing that they can exist and they can have their own consciousness and stuff like it right. blows my mind. But the other stuff, like, you know, I was reading an article earlier before we got on mm -hmm. about how uh, li liberal economic theory has been a complete disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, like the author of this piece I was reading in The Guardian. And by the way, I always put links to references in the episode description. If we something like this comes up, like the book that you mentioned earlier, for example, right. you can add in a sort of a bibliography right. or whatever. But I'll see she, what it was. <laughs> the author was talking about how she gave the example of a, a doctor in Britain who her rent was raised and she couldn't afford the additional rent. And so then she was promptly evicted by her landlord. Mm. And and I was and I was just like, this is insane. A doctor cannot mm -hmm. afford her rent. Right. Mm -hmm. And why is this happening? And how did we allow this to happen? And who is responsible for it? Like mm -hmm. this kind of stuff goes on all the time and people just act as if it's normal or acceptable. And to me, it's completely like our economic system in particular, because mm -hmm. of course it's, it's, it has resulted in the, the climate crisis as well. Right. I mean, the whole thing is completely absurd. And I don't know who said it, but somebody said there is no such thing as a victimless billionaire. It's impossible. It, right. And, and that, by that's definition. Not right right they're exploitative uh, on some level obviously. in one be one between life state i w i was in the between life state i've been you know gone through a death scene and between lives i'm seeing what i was seeing in that space i was being told that most pain in this in the earth experience is human caused now clearly there would still be volcanoes and you know yeah. there would still be you know lions would eat lambs or whatever but that most of what happens to us as human beings we do to each other and that we could stop doing that like and i saw like spirit trying to like raise human consciousness upward to kind of include our intellect because it like wasn't there it, like, <laughs> well we clearly not <laughs> the light bulb wasn't on right the consciousness was down around our belly and our, our drives and our appetites and not up there including our thought life but um but yeah this is um well, well, that's the point, though. The point is, is that right. people are just kind of like sleepwalking or in a daze or something like mm -hmm. like that. We accept all that, like our elected representatives, the people that we elect to represent us are responsible for all of these policy failures that that just create these completely unacceptable conditions and circumstances that people live within all the time. Like there's millions of people on the, living on the streets of America kind of thing. Like, how is that possible? Why do we accept that? That's what I'm getting at. There's this just like, and, you know, I suppose some people think, oh, that's not going to happen to me. Right. But it could. You know, if you're, one of your family right. members gets sick, sick and needs mm -hmm. like $400,000 worth of medical bills or something. But my point is, is it's just overall. Uh, and, and then and then the other thing that comes to my mind is like, why do we incarnate? Like, why do we come here to 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 experience this? Right. <laughs> What's and the that, point? <laughs> that I don't actually have an answer to. That's that's one of the things I walk around going, you know, like, what's it all about, Alfie? You know, this is like, this is not good. Um, yes, I I don't know. I A part of the thing I keep asking and I have not gotten an answer to is, you know, why aren't we already, if we're trying to learn and become perfect, why weren't we already perfect? You know, why, right. like, what's, like, it doesn't, there's something, there is some, definitive disconnect and you're absolutely right this place doesn't make sense right no it, it doesn't it's 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 it insane it's it's like literally insane <laughs> it's it also insane. doesn't make sense to repeat it over and over again yeah right? like uh, like one of the dumbest possible things that a species could do is destroy its biosphere and as a sociologist so <laughs> that's why i'm talking uh, to you by the way because of your so if we if we <laughs> if we talk about people who perpetrate abuse against children most of them were abused as children right and it normalized it to them now if we take the group of people who were abused as children 
the overwhelming majority of them will never abuse a child. They will be disgusted by abusing children. They will have nothing to do with it. Right. But a portion that of the proportion of people who become abusers of children, they were abused. So it's not working. It doesn't if it doesn't work, it doesn't make them less likely to do it again. <laughs> it, it's actually increasing the likelihood that they will be a perpetrator at some level. So so it does not. This does not make sense. Karmically, it doesn't make we don't seem to actually learn our lessons and grow or something. Yeah, like, well, so uh, the, the, satisfied you, with that answer. Well, the general theory is, is that we're created from nothingness. And mm -hmm. we start out kind of at ground zero and we have to go through all of these incarnations. And I think of Siddhartha, right. I think of Siddhartha's moment of enlightenment, <laughs> you know, where mm -hmm. he, he he recalls his incarnation starting out as like rocks and ends up as a human being over right. millions or billions of years, goes through this whole experience. And of course, you make a lot of mistakes along the way, which creates karma, which means that, you know, you're bound to certain mm -hmm. people and places and circumstances that you've got to balance it you know so and then we end up here mm -hmm. i mean that's the theory right that's the theory but the but the also a part of this theory is that that when we're not incarnate we're back kind of in this spiritual state mm -hmm. where we know all this stuff <laughs> right so then why that's do it. we need to come here yeah, exactly <laughs> I, I don't, it doesn't make sense <laughs> we already know it yeah why are we what's the it point again? right what is the point and then, you know, and then why do we have an entire class of people who are getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier on the backs of the poor or in the backs of the working class? And, um, you know, the, the yeah, fact like that the, right now, those people are literally trying to take away our democracy. <laughs> they want to they, install an authoritarian mm -hmm. government with them at the top. Like they basically want to turn America into Russia, which is a mm -hmm. kleptocracy, right? And people right. are supporting them. Some people are actually supporting them, you know, as as I say, being useful idiots for plutocrats. But, you know, it's so absurd. <laughs> right. They want to undo, like for me, the the history of the United States is really the history of its social justice movements. Right. You know, the great part with the abolition, the abolitionist movement, the the labor movement, you know, begun by some mill girls in, in you know, Massachusetts in 1830-ish. Um, the, you know, the abolitionist movements even earlier than that and certainly in full force by then. Um, you know, we move forward through all of the other ver um, versions of the racial justice movement, you know, through the civil rights movement up into Black Lives Matter. We start with, you know, women's um, liberation movements starting the 18 well they start really in the 1700s i guess in england but certainly by the 1840s and um you know and there's been various iterations of those, those are the good things that they want to take back away right the the gay yeah. liberation movement's been going on full force since the 1950s um you know before stonewall so they they want to undo all of that and yet so the homelessness grows if we go back to the end of the 1800s beginning of the 1900s we have two classes in U.S. society anyway. We have, because, you know, Americans are very, uh, US, U.S. people are very Americentric or whatever. So I don't necessarily know everybody else's situation as much. But, um, you know, within the United States, there's the very, very elite who are having the roaring 20s. And then there are a lot, of the, you know, the bulk of us, the 99% are, you know, lower working class struggling. And recent white immigrant groups, and you know, lib, um, uh, people who who had been enslaved and and are not now, but um, are not being paid anything either. And so, all of that, you know, and the uh, the genocide that's already happened against the indigenous population and what whatever survivors there are of that. So we're at this space with this huge number of people with nothing. And this little bit of people with a lot, right? Yeah. And it shifts. It shifts because in order to fight the depression, FDR, in a racially biased way, begins to institute programs that create a middle class. And, um, you know, initially he makes it so 
initially in Social Security in the U.S. If you were a farmhand or you were a domestic, you couldn't, a domestic servant, you couldn't get Social Security. So he effectively cuts out most of the Black population at that point. But they press in and, you know, eventually, like, we're all pressing into these spaces. Um, and we go on through the 30s, the 40s, the post-World War II stuff, and we get into, you know, even Johnson's Great Society program. All of those things create a middle class with a definite hand up for the white middle class, but but other people can at some point, some with some barriers can also press into middle classness. And we end up with most United States citizens thinking they're middle class by the time we get to the 1970s, right? Yeah. And there's real things happen, like we're, you know, mostly not worried about having enough to buy food or heat our homes or do whatever. So we're we're doing reasonably well in this post-World War II space. And then what happens is by Reagan, by the late 70s and certainly by 80, when Reagan comes in, the government makes changes in policy that shift things so that it becomes better for the corporation to offshore their labor than to pay the American worker who has won the struggle for labor rights and has won a 40 hour week and two weeks paid vacation and some health care. Right. They 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 then like we lose all those industrial jobs. They get shipped overseas and, yeah. you know, we become a service economy. Bill and Clinton was part of that, too, by the way. Oh, it keeps going. It's every president, every yeah. president. Since World War II has fomented war and and certainly from Reagan on has done something to undercut the middle class. Yeah. And and we should, we've been shrinking. Sociologists have been talking about the shrinking middle class for a number of decades now. And that one percent just keeps expanding in its wealth. Yeah. And um, and, you know, the report is that the housing in the United States. So we have this huge housing crisis that I refer to it as the, um, you know, as the Great Recession of 2007, 8, 9 and 10, because it wasn't just like 2008. First off, it happens under George W. Obama, ha you know, signs on to the forgiving the banks or what you're know, doing that thing. But um, the stimulus he didn't have a stuff, choice. But, <laughs> He didn't have a choice. It had already happened, yeah. but it continued. People, you know, the people I knew who lost their jobs or lost their homes or had to declare bankruptcy, that that continued all the way through into 2010 yeah, when we yeah. just began to recover. And now the pandemic has done it again. And the word is that major corporations are buying up all of our housing stock and making so much money on it, even if it's, it's like raising the rents to where nobody can, or the mortgage to where no one can afford it. Yeah. And then- the people who would have been middle class are having to sleep on the street and the corporations getting money, leaving it empty because they get to, you know, all sorts of tax breaks and write offs. Yeah. And they had like record low interest rates to, to benefit from for years and years and years because of the housing crisis that they caused. I mean, it's just so that's right. So this is know. New York. This is L.A. This is what's happening. This is why a doctor can't have a house. Yeah. And uh, it's 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 reaching crisis proportions it's terrible here in canada too and the uk and united states all over the place and the inflation i've made the point here myself and mm -hmm. take took a bit of heat for it that the uh, uh all that offshoring that went to china well mm -hmm. china is now a superpower yeah. and they're an enemy yeah that mm -hmm. was also a result of economic policy it's and it so went to stupid. japan it's it went so to japan stupid. first Oh, um, yeah, but that was in the 70s, right? Up. Right, right. Yeah. And, and China is a completely different beast because of their size. I mean, you know, there's like, mm -hmm. what, 1.3 right. billion people? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, right. But that was a direct, the, the fact that that America now has a, a significant adversary and probably will indefinitely, um, no matter what you think, right? Um, right. Is direct result of economic policy. Well, and think of what was happening when Reagan was selling surface to air missile systems to was it I read the Iran Contra um, scandal, right? To to fund the fascist section, you know, the um, fight and, and against, you know, more progressives, he's selling missile technology. And then now we're worried about Iran like. Right. Oh yeah, the the U.S. the U.S. government has has undermined a lot of uh, left leaning or or even centrist governments in so oh, yes. Central America, South America, because they want to keep a lid basically on these parts mm -hmm. of the world for a variety of reasons. In some cases, they're afraid that they will seek reparations from America. 
so even democratic American governments will go and topple regimes in other parts of the world for political reasons that are not democratic. Right. Which is terrible karma. Terrible karma. There's a great book called Harvest of Empire by Juan Gonzalez um, from Democracy Now, but he's a, he's a journalist and he documents the U.S. as as an empire, as a, as a regime, putting in and taking out dictators in all sorts of countries, or taking out the good guys and putting in dictators um, in all of the Latin American countries. Oh, yeah. Uh, and but, unfortunately, you'll never hear that on the mainstream news. Right. 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 It's a, it's it's a huge thing. Uh, my 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 general point, though, was that a lot of these circumstances, uh, you know, the people making these decisions are not mm-hmm. stupid. Mm-hmm. Like, right. for example, the housing situation, they probably saw this coming years ago and they didn't do anything about it. The right. the climate situation, the, the environmental crisis, they've known about this literally for decades right. and didn't do a damn thing about it. You would think that that would be a very high level security threat to the country right. and that people even in the Pentagon would be saying, holy shit, we need to do something about this or else. Right. So, but right. no, everyone's either asleep at the wheel or they are conflicted somehow or they have some weird ideology or they're in the pockets of the plutocrats. So we have documentation that ExxonMobil knew in the 70s, right? Their internal yes. memos have been published in news media. Um, I would think... Wait a second. Let me let me just clarify for the listeners in case people don't know. In, mm-hmm. the, in that time frame, Exxon did their own research that sh- mm-hmm. and made long-term predictions that are eerily accurate to what is happening right now. So we're talking 50 years ago. Right. And this was research that of uh, that, that they their own scientists did this work and made these calculations. Right. They knew they were warming the planet and they yeah. knew they were going to melt the polar ice caps. They knew the oceans would rise. Right. right? And they, they knew, knew and they they calculated based on the levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide how much right. of a temperature increase there would be. And their math right. was spookily accurate like very highly ridiculously accurate 50 years ago and then to make it worse what happened was that they then went on a rampage to try and undermine science Mm -hmm. that reached the same conclusions (laughs) because it threatened because it threatened their industry there's there's no climate now that you're imagining it right so they've oh the climate always changes yeah 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 yeah. yeah, right, right. They funded that misinformation campaign since then, too. Oh, to the tune of hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. But you would think logically, as someone who loves my children and my grandchildren, like you would think that I would think if I'm CEO of a gas or oil company and I find my scientists tell me this, right, and my board, like all of them, right, you would think that they would, one, love their children grand and grandchildren and want them to still have clean air, water, soil, uh, green, green plants and blue skies, right, food. You would think that. And you would also think that you would say to yourself, hey, let's get at the forefront of the sustainable stuff. So you wouldn't shut down your gas and oil production on a dime, right? You would, but you could have spent, you could have taken half your budget or something and put it toward developing wind and solar and all of those things then and become primary in that field and then phased out your gas and oil going, hey, look, we're, and, and been just as rich. Well, you were talking about your ancestor or uh, Mm -hmm. I can't remember it was uncle or, you know, that incident, right? Right. And it, there was a level of irresponsibility involved in that. And oh, it's the same kind of thing, except on a much larger scale with the, the mm-hmm. environmental situation. Like these people are just irresponsible, psychopathic, sociopathic, whatever you want to yeah. say. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they should all be thrown in jail and prosecuted mm-hmm. for this because it's basically crimes against humanity. It's right. bigger. It's bigger than anything else that's ever happened to humanity, because I've said this right. before, but, you know, the scale of it. And the fact right. that it'll it'll last for millennia, right? Like even right now, there's still the oil industry is out trying to convince everyone that we're going to use carbon capture and storage, which is for entertainment purposes only a complete scam because, right. you know, they're just going to take all the carbon dioxide and pump it underground. Oh, well, what happens if there's a little earthquake and all of a sudden it's released back into the atmosphere? Right. <laughs> or one of the lids on the uh, where it's capped gets loose or something over 10,000 years and you know, it's a, it's insane. And the melting permafrost is releasing methane. I mean, yeah, there's yeah, yeah. just, yeah. Well, yeah, I yeah. mean, what's your view of this uh, as a sociologist and anthropologist? I mean, this 
dilemma, this epic dilemma that we face now, which my, the whole point of my little diatribe is is really just that this all boils down to just like this incredible lack of consciousness and responsibility mm -hmm. on the part of society. Like if we can't survive, mm -hmm. we have a serious problem on our hands that, that yeah. deals with our, there's something very flawed about our nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a sociologist, um, I've come to the thought that those who are of that really high powered elite, that they're actually one tenth of one percent, but those that are really up because we we stop counting like I've got a census chart and a you know bell curve and whatever that I show people, um, but the people who are really 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 wealthy and I'm not talking about you know Hollywood um, actor money but you know the the CEOs of the oil companies wealthy Putin wealthy right that kind of wealthy or maybe Bezos and I mean whoever you know in for entertainment purposes only, right? But that <laughs> I've come to the conclusion that, so the hyper-wealthy go to different schools. They don't interact with the rest of us. Um, I had students who a prior professor had assigned them to go and interview people and they were supposed to be interviewing upper class and lower class, working class people, right? And they're coming telling me that the difference, you know, if you buy your coffee at Starbucks, you're upper class. And if you buy your coffee at Dunkin' Donuts, then you are working class. And I'm like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> they're having custom grown coffee beans. You, we got to talk to you. Right? First off, it's not these coffee, you know, you, this depends yeah. on which coffee you like and where what's on your line to work. But, um, you know, the other thing too, is that, no, this is, this is not where the divide is. We don't know them they don't know us mm. if we were part of that super super wealthy class right that very small number of people who are there they go to different schools and the only time they interact with us is um if we're you know serving them food or something we're working at the golf course and we are mowing their lawn yeah some sort of servant capacity but they don't know us as people and so i I believe they're being educated in a way to not like we're educated to think of democracy. We're educated to think of, you know, I don't know, to, like there's a certain rhetoric that goes with it. The, you know, Declaration of Independence type of rhetoric about being created equal. I believe they're actually being educated more on the line of a, of a European monarch, you know, as a child. You're being you were born to rule. And, um, you know, therefore, these people are not the same as you and you need to like it's that mindset. We had it in the American South under slavery for the plantation owners, kids. Right. You were they tried to train you that this person who was feeding you dinner. And I mean, if you're a little white kid on a plantation with um, little black kids that are there that are enslaved, um, you know, those children may be serving you, the, their parents are serving you. You, If you bond with someone who's your nanny or who's your caretaker in some way, um, your white parents, your slave owning parents do everything possible to break the bond and give you some level of, a, of attachment disorder so that you will be able as you grow up and take authority to oppress them also. Right. Yeah. So, like Ron DeSantis is, is wants to teach kids about the benefits of slavery. Um, right. So. <laughs> that what they taught the plantation owner's child, right? They said, "Hey, look, we're doing them a favor. We took them from Africa. We gave them Christianity. yeah. They were Aren't they were we running great? around in Africa with no clothes on, and now they're over here in America. Which you know, right. meanwhile, it wasn't the truth. Africa was full of <laughs> highly advanced civilizations, right? So what you're saying, or what you're suggesting, I think, is just that we live in completely different paradigms, right? But yet, there's. And I've, I keep repeating this, but sometimes things need to be repeated. Yet there's a significant percentage of the population that either deliberately or inadvertently supports that paradigm, which is very mysterious. So we've been sold the idea that we can join them. We've been told any one of us can be president or whatever, but we've also been told like back so back in the 80s when they were do they were running TV shows like Dallas and Dynasty or whatever there was also a life <laughs> lifestyles of the rich and famous wasn't yeah. it like British voiced person speaking and narrating um the American dream what's his name the right so the but the American right so we were sold this American dream that we could actually become one of the super wealthy 
So my dad, before he passed, he, um, you know, he watched Fox and whatever. And, um, and he was being given their misinformation on a regular basis. And he was all opposed to what they were calling the death tax. But the death tax only kicked in if you left like five million or something. Don't hold me to the number. But it was a really (laughs) high number that he didn't have. Believe me, he did not leave that. We fervently looked for why were we worried about this? We were not finding it. But um, yeah, that was all. And, And so they do that kind of spin so that the average middle class to working class person is buying into this idea that we can one get further ahead than we are and two that anything that hurts the rich is also going to hurt us because we might become rich i mean yeah like, that's but it's just propaganda it is but look at so way back in the day there was all this talk about what could be done with brainwashing yeah it's been a lot of brainwashing yeah 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 well i just you know i mean I don't know that there is a simple answer for this, but I'm pretty sure that we'll be dissecting this period of history for a very long time. As long uh, as we survive to do so. Assuming we survive, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. There might well some of us will be living underground in bunkers, right. <laughs> uh, thinking about what the hell were we thinking back, you know, in the early I, 21st century. Yeah, yeah, like Greta Thunberg, like. What are you doing to us? Why aren't? But it, it, the other piece that's wrong in the in the narrative about it is it's not actually you or I, right? And so while the working and middle classes have been sold this you know propaganda line, and the upper classes sold a different one, maybe um, when everybody's like, we have to change this. There's I can recycle my trash, but there's <laughs> not a lot else I can do. Like I can't turn off. The I can't say no, I you know, don't drill in a new place in Alaska. I can't turn off the 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 gas and oil stuff. You know, I can't I can't do there's things that are out of our power and the people who have the power to do it are not us. Yeah, this is a perfect uh, circling back to the whole Cassandra thing that we Mm -hmm. were uh, where which I stymied at the time. Right. That's what we're talking about, right? So there's a right. there's some of us who can just see this clearly, and maybe we have some kind of psychic sense or vision or what, or you know, intuitively or whatever. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, so some of us can. Well, I there's think a speeding there, locomotive, and we're tied to the track. Yeah, and I think that there's there's like I read a lot uh, on a daily mm-hmm. basis, typically, and I can tell it, it's inferred in a lot of the stuff that I read even if it's journalism that, you know, mm-hmm. there's other people out there who are going like, holy shit, <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. what the, what the, we, what, this is insane. Right. And they, and, and in some cases they've been saying it for a very long time. You think of someone mm-hmm. like George Monbiot at the guardian, mm-hmm. you know, right. um, uh, he's been writing about this stuff for decades, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and yet I can honestly say that at this point in time, it's almost like nothing. Well, there have been things done, but they're, they're nowhere mm-hmm. near as consequential as they need to be. Right. And and no one's like no one in power is giving it the um front of mind a uh, constant attention that it needs. No. Nope. Right. So we this is a failure of one group than the other. I mean, yeah. you know, we're, we're gonna limp forward a little longer with the Democrats than the other way, but yeah, it's a continuum. Right, right. And, and right. there's and people are, you know like Joe Manchin, who is, is a Democrat, but, you know, but um, no. so this is a, this is a massive failure mm-hmm. collectively as a species, as a civilization, mm-hmm. as a society, uh, we've hit this wall or, the, yeah. you, or you could say we've, we're approaching this cliff and it looks like we're going to go right off the edge. Mm-hmm. It does. And that, that alone is, is something that is, so remarkable that it's almost hard to convey and it's not as far in the future as they've always made it sound right so the it's all well because the scientists who were calculating were calculating one factor if it warms this happens they mm-hmm. were not counting if the ocean boils that happens they weren't going wait wait there's methane in the permafrost like the, there were so when you put all of the coalescing factors together this is not 100 years from now 
It's no. almost surely in our lifespans, yours and mine, not my grandsons, but my like, so my hope that they could live to be my age has shrunk in. Um, I, I don't see how we can support the population that we currently have personally. Right. Well, un- under if these it conditions. Gets too hot, if it gets too hot, what we don't have is food. Well, that's, right. that's what I, I mean. You, food, right. water, <laughs> uh, heat, stress. You can't work in extreme heat like the, you, you normally do. I mean, it goes on. Uh, like, we don't have the grids or infrastructure to support this. We're going to have sea level rise. We're going to have all these things happening at the same time that any one of which would be catastrophic for humanity. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it gets so, hot enough, we can't be carnivores or vegetarians. Yeah. And the, the ecosystem is collapsing, which is mm-hmm. we're dependent on for our survival from everything from oxygen to food to the water cycle even is affected by this. And it goes, I mean, I could go on and on probably for hours about this. I did a whole episode on emergency preparedness where I tried to, I tried to outline this for people. The only thing I forgot to include was the, that there are certain regions that rely on glacier water melt oh, wow. for water supplies, which includes mm-hmm. India and Pakistan mm-hmm. and places like Calgary and Uruguay and because what happens is the glaciers store snow from the winter, which mm-hmm. is gradually released in the summer and feeds all these great rivers and systems and whatnot. But when the glaciers are gone, those water systems will, in large degree, dry up in the, the hot months. And right. you have like literally billions of people who won't have that water source anymore. And they can't just all pick up and move somewhere. Right. And you can't desalinate water on that scale by any ro- remotely economic means. So, I mean, that's just one other little nugget in the whole big picture of like how crazy it's going to be. So, like I said, I see that civilizational collapse is a distinct possibility, but I also see population collapse as as a byproduct right. of that as well. I can't see how we can sustain the world's current population and economic activity and industrial activity <laughs> under those conditions. And there'll be more pandemics. Probably, yes. In the midst of it all, right? So along with the heat and the lack of food and the r- oceans rising, um, the, the climate migration. Well, like we, we talk about, we talk about what just, we just went through the recent right. pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also a pandemic occurring right now in the avian in mm. bird populations. There's pandemics occurring in trees. There's a right. pandemics occurring, like there's all kinds of pandemics right now. That's not just ones that affect human beings. They believe millions of birds have died in the past few years in the wild bird population. And I believe I believe it was ash. Don't hold me to which tree, but I think it were at, it was ash trees. But last summer, all across Pennsylvania, an entire species of tree died. Yeah, we had elm trees disappear yeah. in Canada. We had like it, mm-hmm. over the past few decades, even I was living in the woods uh, mm-hmm. uh, about a year and a half ago or something, something like that. Two years spent like uh, most mm-hmm. of one year there. And the people who were familiar with that area were were baffled because all the trees were dying. Wow, right. That had been there for like, you know, 50, mm-hmm. 80, 100 years. Was it an insect or they didn't, they never, they didn't. They know. think it was multiple things happening at the same time. They think it was invasive species. They think that it was the water cycle because we go through these periods now where it's very dry for mm-hmm. weeks at a time that never used to happen that we don't get these cold temperatures in the winter anymore that kill off the invasive species. Mm-hmm. Right. It, there's they, they couldn't pin it on one thing, but they were just baffled because, you know, it was occurring on, on a very significant scale and it was really freaking them out. But that's just here. It's happening everywhere. Where I live, we normally have 24 to 34 inches of snow in a year. We had less than an inch this year. Right. And people think uh, they don't think about, you know, the, the, the ecosystems are extremely sensitive to these kinds mm-hmm. of changes. Yeah. Uh, you know, though, I just was reading about, like, for example, the whole peach crop in Georgia was wiped out mm-hmm. because they had early frosts. They or at some no, they had early spring and then they had a sudden frost. Right, right. You know, those kinds of extreme conditions that happened also in in Ontario a few years ago. The whole all yeah. the all the apple orchards got wiped out for a season. Um, anyway, you you just piece it all together and you know it paints this pretty horrific uh, right situation we, but but like i said fundamentally though it goes back to like a fatal flaw mm-hmm. in human nature and our evolution 
right? Now, I don't know if that kind of flaw. Pardon me. How would you label the flaw? What is our what is our broken? well? Well, I mean the the inability to recognize the inability. Like I I've seen it for a very very long time, <laughs> and others have as well. So it, not everyone suffers from it to the same degree, but enough. But some people can't look. There's that, and then there's just some people don't care. Well, and they've all been told through the media for decades that it will happen after they're dead. Yeah, which but that's is a form selfish. of narcissism. Well, yeah, yeah, it's a nar- it's ridiculous narcissism, but it's you know, but they're even today, people still be like, well, in the year 2123, and it's like, what are you talking? It's like, no, like we're gonna be really lucky if this isn't the year 2033. Yeah, you like know? okay, look at what's happening right now. Like uh, it, before we started recording, I was talking about how here where I am in the province of Nova Scotia, less than a year ago, we had Mm -hmm. a crazy hurricane. Mm -hmm. Then this spring, we had a crazy drought, like unprecedented. And then Mm -hmm. we had unprecedented wildfires. And then just a few days ago, we had biblical flooding, where we Mm -hmm. got three months worth of rain in 14 hours. Jeez, There's four Mm -hmm. kind of like, biblically apocalyptic things in less than one year and at the rate we're going the future the not too distant future will be significantly more extreme than that like yeah it's not going to slow down or get better it's going to get worse like for example el nino which is what's causing a lot of this extreme Mm -hmm. weather right now hasn't even peaked yet it's what they're saying is that 2024 is going to be worse than 2023 Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm just talking about this little tiny corner of the world. There's stuff, crazy stuff happening everywhere now. They're saying we're going to look back on this summer and call it one of the cool ones in our, you know, like um, it's it's actually unspeakable. Yeah. How cavalier the lack of responses. Yeah. So I'm like, OK, so, you know, I, this is stuff I've said before in other mm-hmm. conversations, right? Um, like there's part of me that's going like, okay, stepping up, like if we go to the 10,000 foot view, Mm -hmm. what the hell is happening here on earth and why? (laughs) And are we, you know, is in the future, is someone going to do like a past life regression and come back to the 2020s and go like, oh my God, (laughs) you know, what, what were we doing? What was happening on earth? Like, this is like trauma on a cosmic scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had a number of clients who in their just, you know, unexpectedly out of nowhere, who so start talking about a past life and a past life death, um, talked about dying in the 1918 flu pandemic, right? So yeah, I think if the human species survives enough that in the future, there's somebody able to do hypnotherapy, there are going to be a lot of people going, oh, I died when the ocean rose. You know, I died when, um, you know, when that apocalyptic rain came. I died and I got trapped in the forest fire. Or, right. you know, there, there's because those then those things are happening now. But the media rhetoric makes us makes us think it's not happening in our air quote civilized Western societies. Like it's going to, but it is. Like Greece is burning right now. You yeah. Know, it's fake. Portugal, it, you know, it's it's all like I never thought Canada would burn, right? To me, it, Canada's wet and snowy to my mind. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've I've got a photo and I'll uh, I'll include it in this. I'll mm-hmm. show it in this episode. And by the way, some some people listen to me on podcasts, but often mm-hmm. I put graphics and things even in the discussions. Right. Um, but the boreal forest stretches all the way from Newfoundland to British Columbia and up into Nunavut or the Northwest, what used to be called the Northwest Territories. Canada is the second largest country by landmass on the planet. Mm-hmm. Bigger mm-hmm. than the United States. Wow, wow. And like a huge swath of it is forest. Mm-hmm. So people think, oh, why don't they go clean? Like the 45 said, oh, go clean up the forest. It <laughs> would probably take before. thousands of years to, mm-hmm. if you could even mm-hmm. do that, to, to do that. Right. Like it, the scale is so vast, like people have no idea. Like, so if that dries out or an invasive species go in, create dead wood and, you know, it's like mm-hmm. a tinderbox. I mean, right. we don't have enough firefighters and planes and water bombers. and Like the scale is just like it. I'll give an example. The province of Ontario, which is just one province. 
Right. If you get in a car on the eastern side of Ontario and you drive across the Trans-Canada Highway, by the time you get to Manitoba, if you mm-hmm. don't stop for one minute, if you drive the whole time, it mm-hmm. takes 22 hours mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. get from one side of Ontario to the other. And that's just one province. And that's just one province. That, I mean, the scale is just mind boggling. And basically for that same time limit, you can go at least from Philadelphia to the tip of southern tip of Florida. Probably. So, yeah, yeah. Um that's just one province. Well, and the thing about that forest, like, so we we know and we worry rightly about the Amazon as the lungs of the planet, but what is that Canadian forest? Well, that's lungs? another point, right? It's a huge carbon sink. And when you burn it, you're releasing the carbon into the atmosphere. And nobody's really talking about that right now. Mm-hmm. It's also not making the generating the oxygen anymore that it would have. That's right. The other thing is that people don't realize, and I, this is going to, we're getting into darker and darker territory, mm-hmm. but phytoplankton in the oceans produce 40% of the world's oxygen. Mm-hmm. As the oceans are acidifying, as they absorb, mm-hmm. they're, they're absorbing the vast majority of the carbon dioxide, but that causes the ocean to acidify. And the the alkalinity of the oceans or the pH balance is very sensitive. If it gets slightly too acidic, by even a small amount, there go the phytoplankton and there go all the shells and mollusks and mm-hmm. because their 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 shells will literally dissolve. It doesn't take much. And yeah. uh so I mean, like I said, that's 40% of the world's oxygen supply right there, just from the oceans. And, and our food source again, yeah. Right. Like if I remember years ago, a long time ago, hearing a marine biologist state that if the marine food web collapses. Mm-hmm. It's game over for our species. Because? Because that we cannot allow the oceans to go anoxic. They become toxic. Well, and they're, they, obviously the whales, the sharks, the, the orca are suffering. They're experiencing negativity in their environment now. Yeah, like the, the phytoplankton are basically the base of the food chain. If you mm-hmm. take them out, the rest of the food chain collapses. The whales, everything depend upon that, right? Right. She said that when she had this realization of what was happening with ocean acidification, she said she started sobbing uncontrollably Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of the implications. Right. Right. Like, you remember that thing where all the dead fish washed up on the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, there's been mass die-offs a number of times. There was like thousands and thousands of fish just washed up on the beach because the water gets too hot. Anyway, yeah, it, it all, you know, like people don't know about these kinds of things. Um, Mm -hmm. because you have to do, it's a com, it's a very complex subject. You have to do a lot of reading to really start to understand this. But when you start putting it all together, like I said, you know, you're burning the forest. It's not just the fires. It's Mm -hmm. like they have been storing carbon sometimes for hundreds of years. Yeah. And now that's being released back into the atmosphere very quickly. So, um, it compounds this whole problem. There's another thing that people don't realize Mm -hmm. is that we have to clear up air pollution right? Which mm-hmm. is, which is, it's a byproduct of the internal combustion engine and things like that. Right. Well, there's a feedback that occurs when you clear up the atmosphere, it mm-hmm. allows more solar radiation into the planet. Which just again, hotter. Yeah. So uh, we, we definitely need to reduce our carbon emissions. There's no question about it. That's the number one priority. But when mm-hmm. we do that, there's going to be a bump in the global temperature. So they keep talking about whether or not, you know, when we get to tipping points, but where are we actually at? Well, that's the big question is, are we already at tipping points or not? And it's hard to say. Uh, Mm -hmm. The recent events have been so dramatic that people are starting to seriously suggest that. And Mm -hmm. the White House recently floated the idea of geoengineering, which I've Mm -hmm. mentioned a few times before. But so I thought the fact that they were stating that publicly at such a high Mm -hmm. level is very telling. And it suggests that we're kind of almost in desperation mode if we're not already. They're not going to come out and tell the public because they don't want people to panic. And while they keep panicking, they keep doing things. Yeah, go ahead. And then another really big event that occurred recently too was that they discovered that, yes, the Greenland ice sheet has actually melted entirely in the past. They thought that that might be possible, that it might take thousands of years, but now they recognize, because what they found is they found remains or evidence Mm. uh, at the bottom of the glaciers of life, like plant life. 
Mm -hmm. which obviously that can only occur if there's no ice sheet there. So the Greenland ice sheet is worth about 22 feet of sea level rise. That's just the Greenland ice sheet alone. Right. right. So the, 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 they're now concerned that the whole thing could collapse in fairly short order. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, most of Florida, most of Southern Florida is a meter above sea level or three feet. So 21 feet. I right. mean, you know, <laughs> like, right, right. Like, Gone. you're talking like you're talking like Southern Florida is under like 18 feet of water. Most of the eastern seaboard. Yeah, you can't build the barriers against because no. you also get storm surge and tidal surges and stuff. So you're actually talking like 28 feet or 30 or 40 feet. But, You'd have to have 40 or 50 foot walls around New York City. Well, that's right. just not going to happen. Right. And and then how far in does the ocean come into New Jersey? How far in does it come into New England? How far in right. does it come, you know, on the eastern shore of Canada? Like, Yeah. And how can the global economy survive something like that? Or, or how can you even maintain civil society under those kinds of circumstances right. where you have hundreds of millions of people migrating in right. short order and so on? Like the insurance industry would be wiped out, the real estate industry would be wiped out, um, the, a lot of agriculture would be lost, you'd have a lot of homeless people that probably have to live in encampments. It just gets really apocalyptic really quickly. And the presumptions, it's always the other guy. The presumption is never that I'm the climate migrant. Oh no! This is happening. It's going to happen in the states. Like Florida is right. a write-off. I can guarantee. I can guarantee you that Florida is a write-off. Louisiana, Texas, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the like the North and Carolina, South Carolina, all along the coast will be, you know, right. uh, even our. We have a province here called PEI. That's a gone. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it goes on and on and on. Like right, right. But this is going to go on for dececades and generations. And where it's not flooded, it's going to be too hot. And That's the other thing, right? right? And then extreme weather events, like uh, they'll probably have to make a new category for hurricanes, like mm -hmm. category six. <laughs> uh, and, you mm -hmm. know, we don't have buildings and infrastructure that can sustain those kinds of conditions. I mean, I don't want to go all apocalyptic, but I mean, this is kind of like, the, I think we can anticipate these kinds of things. And this is human foolishness. We didn't, as a species, we didn't need to do this. You... Those of us who are not in that 1% of billionaires, we didn't have the power to make any mistakes. Yeah, did. the billionaires probably think they can make some kind of closed off. Well, actually, they're doing it in Saudi Arabia. They build bunkers and then they try to build spaceships yeah, to get to the, is it Is it Saudi Arabia or the UAE where they've basically built a whole city that's enclosed? But how do you grow food if the temperature is a steady 130 degrees? Well, they have greenhouses. <laughs> Right. But that, but here's the thing, like you're are, not going to fit them themselves because the, here's gonna the thing: it. you're not going to fit eight billion people in these walled off cities, <laughs> right? This is not going to happen. And and they're not used to working for themselves or serving their like growing or serving their own food, right? So, it's, it's only the very richest people that are going to be allowed mm -hmm. into these places, right? So there's going to be enclaves of like super wealthy people, the privileged, and then the rest of us will be out trying to survive in these apocalyptic conditions and they're the the those those people are the you know the super wealthy are the least best choice for repopulating when the earth cools down again yeah they're they're the worst human beings you could possibly find to uh, to perpetuate the species propagate mm -hmm. the species um what was that movie the hunger games right 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 it's it's like the hunger games think like that's what we're talking about yeah but here's the thing like on a spiritual level i don't understand why what the point of all this is for us right and and in the midst of that when this makes no cognitive sense my personal experience is that there is some sort of presence that comes when i meditate you know there is some sort so my experience is there is some sort of higher power but how does like the higher power and i need a serious talk because it's just yeah something's logically inconsistent here well it's kind of like we're in a in a a movie almost and mm -hmm. they're not going to tell us the plot before right we get to that scene, you know, because it defeats the purpose of the whole thing. Because I'm sure on a very high spiritual level, this is just all a drama mm -hmm. that that isn't as real as we think it is. <laughs> like and, the, the, the creator right. could recreate the entire universe in a nanosecond, probably. 
<laughs> so, and the guard, so. the Guardian reporter that you talked about, has been reporting for decades on the climate. You know, if I were hypnotizing him in a future life, he would look at that at this life, and he'd go, "Well, I did my best. I tried. You know, I I fought the fight. I yeah, I tried. I was I was consistent. I was ethical. I did all I could. I was in the struggle, and he'd feel good about that. Like best choice he could." What's happening here is obviously extremely dramatic. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the afterlife or whatever, we'll probably be talking to other souls and beings. They're going mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, you were on Earth when that happened. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> like we have to get coffee and talk about it. Exactly. Yeah, it's like yeah. war stories, you know, mm -hmm. um, stuff that happened that is just unbelievable because it, I'm sure that there's other civilizations. If they're observing us, they're going like, can you believe what those insane humans are doing? And I mean, there, there's a level at which, you know, maybe we should all join Greta and the school strike. We should be getting arrested on Fridays. We should, you know, but there's another level at which the fight, the environmental movement has been going for dec for, well, it's certainly been going since Silent Spring. There was a conservation movement even sooner, you know, but it's been going on for maybe a hundred years or maybe, maybe more. And, um, you know, they've actually been hounded by secret service more than a, most movement like you know the actual yeah looking you know following them watching them you know those kinds environmental activists have been you know seriously watched yeah uh, they the, the, we know this now because of access to information but in canada the our police uh, i guess it's equivalent to something like the fbi or something but mm -hmm, the royal right. canadian mounted police had files on anyone who was an activist or a socialist mm -hmm. or whatever up here yeah, and we knew Her Herbert, who, uh, not, not Herbert, right? We knew, um, yeah, the guy in charge of the FBI here for all those years, um, not Herbert Hoover, the president. I know who but, you mean. Uh, My brain is starting to go blank. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, he, uh, yeah, he actually, the evidence was found. So there were people who invaded an FBI office in 1971 in Media, Pennsylvania, Um I went to the funeral of one of them. Um, he was a fellow professor when I was at a certain university, but he, um, he and like eight of them broke into an FBI office, took all before the Pentagon papers a year before they took all the files and then they sent them to the Washington post and the New York times and the post published them. Um, but they revealed, they found in there this whole counterintelligence program by the FBI where the FBI had actually had a paid informant in every women's suburban consciousness raising group where six housewives got together to drink coffee and bitch about how the husband wouldn't do the uh the dishes <laughs> you know? i mean just you know he considered that to be one of the most dangerous movements and um so yeah so they were all in all of the every this this documentation also showed they had infiltrated every single black group in the united states if there was a women's auxiliary to a church they were in it, not just, you know, civil rights groups, but all of every. I'd go so far as to say that that is still probably happening. But, you know, and whatever whatever they deem as a threat to the status quo is 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 being watched on some level. Right. For, for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. We, well, why yeah. wouldn't they? Yeah. Like, they, of course they would. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, not, nothing about that has particularly. We have no reason to believe any of that's really changed. No, the only bizarre thing about that is that they're, they're that they're they're really trying to preserve this status quo, which is diametrically opposed to their best interests. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is what's so twisted about the whole thing. Yeah, right. There's it's that true. side of it. Like, I mean, you know, like people are working on behalf of these privileged people mm -hmm. who want to basically enslave them. And that was the origin of the of like independent police forces back in the labor movement. And still, I mean, the countries that hire mercenaries, all part of that. Well, um, the only other thing I didn't talk to you about that was on my mind, but I know we've mm -hmm. been on here for a long time. So we don't have to if you don't want to. I meant to ask you about what your experience is or any concerns you have as a scholar or an academic talking about these kinds of things. Well, I'm glad I don't live in certain states right now. <laughs> in, in certain states, people who teach what I teach, of course, the coursework I teach are all have already been fired. Programs have already been closed down. Um, it is a 
it's one of the speeding trains coming down the track. There's there's the climate on the one hand. The other is, you know, the um, the, uh, of pressure against actual scholarship and free speech and academic freedom and free speech and scholarship. And um, when they come against those programs, they're coming against 50 years of African-American studies programs are coming against the same length of time of women's studies programs and, you know, uh, all ge and gender studies and all of that is, um, yeah. So I happen to live in what's called a blue state. And at present, the state that I'm in is fine. But if the political system at the federal level changes, that, that also changes because, um, universities are corporations. And uh, I believe it was DeSantis who made the point that if you cut the money, it'll just wither up or shrivel or whatever term he used for it to dry up. But um, but there's a certain level of truth in that. And so scholarship can be, has been subjugated when there have been authoritarian takeovers in other countries. And, you know, it can, um, it, it really, it matters desperately who was elected um, in the, you know, in 2024 and every, you know, every one of these elections, it matters that, it matters that the public um, perception remain good as well. I did a, my dissertation on the, on the uh, gay marriage movement, the same sex marriage movement or the marriage equality movement. But in that space, one of the big things was people's coming out narratives helped other people see that they had a cousin, a brother, a nephew, uh, a, you know, a sister, a daughter that that was gay and helped them. So the public rhetoric changed before the law changed to allow for, for marriage equality. Um, of course, there's pushback against that with, you know, lawsuits claiming that, you know, it's somebody's religious freedom not to make a wedding cake or, you know, not to do a website for a same-sex couple. But that public narrative matters. The public narrative was hugely important. Every social movement is fought for laws, but the other side of it, the, the non-legal side of it is for the public perception. And, um, you know, there was in in regard to women's rights or in regard to um, to racial rights in the United States, all of that has been fought at both levels. And so it really matters what is said about these things. And there's such, I'm, I'm really concerned about the brainwashing that goes with the propaganda, because if you mention, if I mention what I teach in certain places now, some people who've been feeding on the misinformation gasp and assume bad things about me and Gosh. my coursework, that's not at all true. God. Uh, so it's you know, so dangerous. I don't know why they allow it to occur. It is the disinformation. I mean, yes. I mean, what you're describing, I mean, when they go after the academics, typically in history, that has been mm -hmm. like a flashing red light warning. Yeah, right. And they are they've already done it in Florida. They're doing it in Texas. They're yeah. doing, you know, like in, in history, the, 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 the events that followed because they don't stop there. It's not too much further down that trajectory. You're into open fascism. Right. So they are forbidding the teaching of African American history accurate, the accurate teaching of it in Florida, right? When they talk about the fact of the matter is, I, I interviewed somebody um for my program that um actually was a, you know pretty high up in the New York City school district. I interviewed him two years ago. He was there three years ago. Um don't don't say his name because we don't want him to just like disappear. He's no longer there, but he. I'm, I'm being facetious. Pointed out, a bit. He pointed out that he, um, you know, that we don't teach history to grade school children at all anymore, like at all. There's no space for it since George W. Bush put in uh, the teaching to the test with the no child left behind stuff. Grade school teachers and mostly middle school teachers have almost no space in their time or for their in their curriculum to teach any history at all period. So when you get into middle school around, you know, in, in the Northeastern United States now, you'll get just a little bit of social studies. You won't get anything at all, really at all. You get to a smidgen in high school. I get college undergraduates who are just going, I didn't know this. Why didn't I know this? Oh my but God, that's, that's terrifying. History, they don't, they come into college not knowing, knowing almost no history. That's frightening. Um, right. And, and so, right. So they know nothing. They know like, 
They've heard of Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, and that's all they know of Black history and, and Martin Luther King. And women's history, they've heard of Susan B. Anthony, and they've heard of George Washington. Like, that's that's what they know as they arrive on the shores of college. And so that whole, all of that stuff about teachers are propagandizing our children, no, they're not. You know, they're teaching to the tests. Oh, I, the, I don't buy the bullshit at all. I, I, yeah. I, I see, I can see right through it personally, but like you said, the, the problem is that a lot of people don't. But people, and then people assume if I just simply teach factual history at the college level that, you know, it's propagandizing children and like, no, that just, these are facts, <laughs> you know, well-documented fact. Do your peers share your concerns generally? Most of my peers don't teach my subjects. So generally speaking, many of them don't have to worry about it. But do they worry about it anyway? <laughs> yes. Okay, yes. that's so good. That's good. In general, people in the social sciences are concerned. Certainly historians are concerned, sociologists, anthropologists, social scientists in general, political scientists. The people, I don't know that the people over in, you know, math and science are like over in those spaces are worried at all. And they don't actually have anything to be concerned about um, as far as what they teach. Those are the things, the STEM fields are, you know, what is being promoted as fine. Right. Because that's how you make money. Because that's how you make money. So, um, yeah. but we're looking at a huge shift in, um, in the college systems, not not one that brings the prices down to be reasonable so more people can can go without debt but we're looking at um like shutting down humanities and social sciences um as subjects of study i mean the what made america great was an educated populace yes i mean this is way it's like cutting off your legs or something it's just it seems so crazy it is it is but if you're an authoritarian, you don't want an educated populace. I know, but China isn't going to stop educating its people, probably on the contrary. And and I would assume, you know, with the fact that it is an authoritarian state, I would assume that their education on some of the social stuff is, is you know, skewed and limited, perhaps. For sure, but, for sure. Um, yeah, but this is, this is really, really dangerous. Well, you know, I mean, it, just the fact that people go into like almost a form of, of endangered servitude to get a degree these right. days in the states. China is not. Mm -hmm. China is probably just going to take its best and brightest and educate the crap out of them, and right. they're not going to probably do that to them. I mean, it it doesn't make sense to me on any level, except unless you want to be the one percent of the one percent. It's also heartbreaking as a student of social movements to watch what was fought for over 150 years um, just be undone, like have the Supreme Court take a stroke of a pen and undo this or that, or yeah. have, uh, you know, have departments, uh, whole departments have been shut down in Florida. They, they have fired tenured people, right? It's not just people without tenure. It's just, the, you know, all of that. It's, it's heartbreaking to watch that which was fought for with people's, you know, blood and tears. Um, well, they have, through propaganda, they have villainized mm -hmm. the educated class or, or mm -hmm. they have. population. They've uh, made them mm -hmm. a target. And they've sold the people, the people they've sold that to, they've also sold to them the idea that they don't need to join us. They don't need to become educated. And, and yet they don't have really, you know, they don't make a living either. Or they certainly, they make a lesser living. And then, you know, what happens to them as they go forward and buy into it? Like it's none of it's good. None of those out. No, it's all, it's quite dystopian. Mm -hmm. um, and when you couple it with all the other things we were talking about earlier, about the environmental mm -hmm. crisis, for example, you're like, okay, how does this play out? Mm -hmm. right, <laughs> I, don't, right. I don't know. But uh, on the other hand, I just recently did a discussion with a lovely mm -hmm. uh, lady who's a psychic named Deborah mm -hmm. Lupin. And okay. according to her guidance, uh, that she's very confident in that we're going to prevail. And if that happens, then yeah, then it's an entirely different outcome, right? So yeah. we know in the past what's happened when authoritarians have taken over. We know what's happened to education and whatever. And then those cultures, if they came around the corner again and became more free again, then things were restored. But in this case, 
whatever questions we have about those who are perhaps corporate Democrats or whatever, if one party wins, a lot of bad things happen. If the other party wins, then a lot of good things survive. And maybe we at least limp forward a little in regard to the climate, right? So yeah. we need a lot more from the Democrats that we elect. But if she's right and um, and the House, Senate and presidency go Democratic in 2024, then, yeah, then we have a really good chance of. What they were saying is that there's something about the 2025, 26, 28 mm -hmm. time frame which right. is this major shift that we're going through. So we're, it's still a few years out, obviously, you know, five and some years. Some of the people who are reporting, having looked at the future, are reporting our survival as a, as a nation at some level. Um, and some places in the United States still having some levels of freedom. So, yeah, so it doesn't look like the worst case scenario. No, but it's, it's still, there's still going to be, there's still going to be bad, like we can't turn around the climate thing, even if we stop all emissions tomorrow. It, it's like a train or a ship. It's just going to keep moving for a long time. Right. So we've already gone past where we should have. Right. So uh, we're going to have to deal with that. But we can do that in a more orderly versus disorderly way, which is what my right. preference would be, <laughs> obviously. Right. Make Absolutely. the best of a best. You make the best of a bad situation. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it does seem like many of the psychics out there are seeing good things for 2024 electorally. Yeah. And and with that, there is there is hope. Yeah. Yeah, the rest of it we're going to have to see, I guess. Well, you know, we've been talking for a very long time. Yeah, I know. You're going to have to split it in two or something. I think I will have to do it in two, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to converse well, with this, me. And This has been delightful. It's fascinating to get your perspective. I would have liked to have heard you talk a bit more about some of your other things, like your involvement in feminism and all that stuff. So maybe we'll do another one sometime. Yeah, but we covered a lot of territory here, and then we yeah. could conceivably go off on some more specific topics down the road. Uh, and your what you talked about, all your experience with uh, regression and stuff, I'm sure people are going to find that absolutely fascinating, as much as I did. I do, I do have a booking website. <laughs> yeah, let's so throw that out there. I'll... I'll okay. include your contact information in the episode description. Okay. Okay. And if people want to contact you, uh, right. I mean, I, I'm fascinated. I'd be, a, especially at the fact that you can do it remotely. I mean, you could do it for anyone anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. As long as we can work out the time zones. <laughs> yeah. I just have to figure out what my blocks would be that I would want to target, you know? Right. Right. You just sort of come up with, initially, you just come up with uh, like a question that you want to start with. And then that takes us all kinds of places. All right. So, um, so yeah, all you have to do is start with one. Cool. Very interesting. Hmm. One block, one question. Well, I'm very happy. I'm very glad that we connected and that you were gracious enough to give us so much of your valuable time. So, yeah, thanks very much, Nadine. Thank you. I'm really, this has been a real joy and a privilege. Likewise. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. If you'd like to contact Nadine, you'll find a link in the episode description. I'll put links in the episode description to any related content, and if you're interested in a reading with me, I'll put a link to that as well. Many sincere thanks to everyone who supports me, especially my YouTube members. Thank you very much. Take care, all the best, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.